Welcome everybody to the New Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Colin McEwen. Today I'm here on the Miramichi River in New Brunswick, and we're fishing for what is unquestionably my favorite game fish, Atlantic salmon. I'm joined today by Michael Brislane, who's the author of a great book called Bugging the Atlantic Salmon. This book's all about bombers and bugs and how they're used for Atlantic salmon fishing. As well, surprisingly, they're really great flies for large trout, such as brown trout and rainbows. In today's show, we'll be talking about the tactics and strategies used to catch fish with these two great flies, and we'll talk about the history as well. Stay with us, it's gonna be a great show. on the beautiful and renowned Miramichi River in New Brunswick. For well over a century, anglers have been drawn to this province by the allure of fishing for the king of game fish, Atlantic salmon. We are staying at the Upper Oxbow Lodge, which is located at the lower end of the Miramichi River near the ocean. Michael has written an excellent book that describes the various types of bombers and bugs successfully used for Atlantic salmon. Many do not realize, but these patterns are also excellent for steelhead and other species. We now join Michael as he talks a little bit about his book. Probably, or I started, but probably about 93, 94. And uh, actually it was an idea that came to me, you know, very, very slowly. Um, I had always enjoyed, you know, great successes with, you know, fishing the bug. Uh, I lived right in Fredericton and I had fished the St. John extensively for over 20 years until the river system was closed for conservation. But one thing that sort of occurred to me, I used to very, very frequently see first-time anglers, you know, first season in, uh, probably, you know, flailing the water, you know, beating their hearts out, so to speak, and having, you know, very, very limited success. Um, these bug patterns, uh, they're simple, they're don't look like they're very much, but um, if they're fished, you know, in the manner that I've been trying to uh, describe, you will take fish. This is actually a, looks like a great tool for uh, using a bomber and a bug, and. Uh, Mike's going to be telling us a little bit about the tackle and strategies that, uh, oh, that, that's a nice salmon. Um, he's going to be talking about the tackle, the techniques, and the strategies used uh, when uh, employing bombers and bugs. But first, uh, Mike, if I could ask you to tell us a little bit about the history of how uh, these uh, flies came into being for Atlantic salmon fishing. Uh, the history begins with uh, one particular individual column. That was Reverend Elmer Smith. He's deceased now. But uh, he did have a parish in uh, Prince William, which is about 30 or 35 miles north of Fredericton. The story goes was that um, when he lived in Massachusetts, he used to fish the Royal River in southern Maine for sea-run brown trout. Uh, there was quite a following. These fish were large, probably 10 to 15 pound range. Um, and one evening, uh, when a run of these sea-run browns were in and nobody was having any success, this young boy waded into the pool and started to cast a deer hair, deer hair mouse. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that this thing was just waking on the surface, and next thing, he had on a 10-pound uh, brown, you know, which he landed. Now, Father uh, Smith was not um, unknown to New Brunswick salmon fishing, but uh, one winter, the story goes, he got this idea that if this deer hair mouse will take, you know, sea run brown trout, maybe something of a similar nature would work on Atlantic salmon. And so he developed the bomber pattern. Mike, could you explain the shape of how, you know, the bomber looks like a cigar with hackle? How did that come about? It's a good question, Colin. I, I really don't have the answer, aside from, I think, that what uh, Father Smith had in mind was a fly that would make a lot of surface disturbance on a, on a downward swing. 
that you traditionally use in fishing wet flies because these bombers were originally designed not to be fished as a wet fly, uh, as, a, as a dry fly per se, but they were designed to be cast across and allowed to quarter downstream, creating a weakening for a surface disturbance, which would entice the salmon to rise to a fly. And that's what they, they home in on a lot of times. It's not just a, a dead drift. I mean, you, you want to use that as well as sometimes a waking, because I understand in Newfoundland and another, like in Labrador, the waking motion is yes. what they home in on. And well, this is where you get your rifling uh, fly technique, where they purposely tie the leader to, to the eye of the fly at an angle so that the fly will rise, creating a sort of a bee wake or a bit of a surface disturbance, which in, in that part of Atlantic Canada works extremely well. Mm -hmm. The same technique was, was used in the bomber. Of course, your bug patterns you know, developed from there. The story goes that with Father Smith, I mean, he had a great initial success. You know, with the bombers, uh, they came into use. I can remember reading an article, uh, I believe, uh, in the magazine. I, I forget the name of it, but I think it was Garcia that put it out. And the first reference to that pattern, I believe I saw in about 1969, and it was called a cigar butt. It wasn't called a bomber, but it was exactly the same as you see them today. Uh, now, the story goes that uh, uh, Father Smith, with his great initial success, somewhere along uh, the uh, way it discovered that a bomber fished wet was even more productive. It was great as long as you had normal flows, but once you started to get into summertime conditions with low water, warmer water, you know, the salmon tend to be very uh, sedate. They tend to just stay in one place. They don't become active. And it's uh, standard salmon uh, techniques. Low, warm water, you go to a smaller fly. So what he did was he said, well, he said, the bomber works great. Let me cut it down to size. He did. He used a smaller bomber, smaller body, thinner body, still fished them as a dry fly. Mm -hmm. But there again, it evolved that when these things became waterlogged, they just increased in effectiveness. And this is where you get your bug patterns. When they were originally tied, uh, they were just simple deer hair. Uh, brown hackle, uh, undyed deer hair colors. Uh, they had no fluorescent butts or tags, uh, no crystal flash, but uh, the story goes that the green machine was developed by Father Smith on the Nashwalk River, which is a tributary to St. John. And uh, I have spoken to some anglers who knew him and fished the Nashwalk, and he had absolutely phenomenal success just using that one pattern from season start to season end. And Today, probably the green machine bug fished wet, I would say probably accounts for 75% of all the fish taken in the Miramichi system. Miramichi is considered by many to be the greatest Salonic salmon fishing river in the world. The river begins in the heartland of the central highlands and is fed by a multitude of small tributaries. Each of these tributaries possess their own specific genetic strand of Atlantic salmon. Could you explain a little bit about the different hook sizes relative to the water conditions? Because as I understand it, you're going to go to a smaller bug or bomber uh, based on the time of year and, and the water depths, high, low water, low water. Certainly, Colin. I would say that probably the most effective hook size is the number six. And I would use that if the water you know, with normal conditions or, or slightly low. It's a good all-around size to use. However, if you start getting into moderate flows, like especially like after rain and the river's on the rise, and uh, it becomes a little heavier, I prefer to use a, a bug that's got a little more size to it, a little more body as in thickness. Um, I like the thin profiles, but when the water does get up, I use a thicker bug. If the water gets extremely low, you know, salmon are, are going to get finicky. Um, they're going to become relatively stationary. And what your most effective patterns are is to getting down to about number seven, number eight, or even a number ten. Really. But to go to a fly smaller than number ten, Colin, I, I think that uh, you're getting into stunt fishing, because to get add on to a leader, you're probably going to have to go, go down to about a four pound test. And if you hook a large salmon and you're going to play it, 
That's uh, unacceptable. It's not acceptable because no. you get the fish in to where you can net it or tail it, you're going to exhaust it and perhaps to the point where it will not recover. Yeah. So small flies are, are fine, but if, it, if your purpose is just to hook them and get one or two jumps and break them off, great. I recognize some of these as being the green machine, but uh, this is one I'm fairly new to. The, the Smurf? The Smurf. <laughs> Colin, I don't know who originated it, but I did, I did come across it. It's had its days. Uh, I remember one uh, story in particular. Oh, I'm going back a number of years now. That uh, there was a fellow fishing in Nashville that was the uh, covered bridge pool. And it was in September. And there was a number of anglers there fishing those standard wet flies and standard bugs. Nothing occurred until this fellow started to use this blue bug called the Smurf. And the story goes that he proceeded to release long salmon that afternoon. Wow. That's pretty great for long salmon fishing. It is. But as I said, Colin, there are, there are you know, color, uh, standard color patterns. I mean, these things can be tied uh, out of any color deer hair imaginable. But if you stick to the greens, olives, browns, whites, blue, and black, you've pretty well covered it. Great. Uh, you can take that off. Let's show the viewers some of your bombers here, because uh, these, these are really great-looking flies. Colin, bombers are nothing but a, a beefed-up bug. They've got a longer body, a little thicker body, a tail to keep the uh, back end of the hook up. Uh, they're wound with a, a double layer of the dry fly hackle. There's two dry fly hackles wound forward here, and um, they use like a, a floatant this is the one you were saying to me earlier, this uh, olive one was good on the gas bay? Yep, this is probably the number one fly that they use in the gas bay. Uh, it's got uh, an olive body of deer hair, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. white wolf uh, tail for the wings, and an olive and a double olive hackle. Um, a friend of mine, uh, last year, uh, not last year, uh, but the year before, was on a gas bay, and he took a uh, 26-pound salmon on this. Really? Now, something that's interesting is that um, I've actually used some of these in warm water and have caught uh, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, especially when I wake them or just mm -hmm. when they first hit the water. And I know we were using brown ones, and this is something a lot of uh, people uh, don't know about, is that some of these brown patterns in the bombers are excellent for brown trout, especially as it's getting darker just after dark and you wake them across the surface, the brown trout will just home in on them. Well, I think they represent on a very large terrestrial either like a very large stonefly or, or a helgramite, an adult a helgramite fly, which they call the Dobson fly. Um, and certainly, you know, brown trout, once they get up above two pounds, they do become meat eaters, and they're on the prowl for something substantial. Um, I just wanted to point out to you, Colin, we're here in the little southwest Miramichi, and as you can see, this whole panorama, it's a beautiful holding pool. But um, in salmon fishing, there's only going to be specific areas where the fish are going to hold. Just above us here, we have this broken water flowing towards that sharp uh, ledge that's coming out. But just down here, you can see this pan, well, I call it a pan, of flat water where the water flattens out. That's where the salmon are going to be holding in there. The Atlantic Salmon Federation, which is based in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, has been fighting to preserve, protect, and enhance stocks of Atlantic salmon. Danny Bird came to talk to me about some of the work that ASF has been involved in, in the last few years. In New Brunswick, our regional council has identified five issues which fit very nicely in place with the Strategic Conservation Plan of the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Those five issues include the elimination of all gill nets in the waters of New Brunswick, uh, catch and release or live release angling, which is, which is very important to the economic factor of the recreational fishery as well as the conservation aspect. Better enforcement and protection methods within our, our provincial and our federal government when it comes to the Atlantic Salmon Resource better cooperation between the federal government and the provincial government when it comes to the Atlantic Salmon Resource. And, and last but not least, the, a responsible aquaculture industry. In 
and salmon fishing. What most anglers use is a, is a 45 degree quartering downstream cast, which is very effective when you're fishing your standard hair wing flies for Atlantic salmon. But fishing with bugs is a little bit different in the sense that uh, it's uh, almost akin to nymph fishing. And the best way I can describe it is that um, I found bugs to be most effective when you present a broadside view to the fish uh, showing its profile. The advantage of this cast is that uh, if you get into conditions where you have like a high bank or you're up against a wall of vegetation like alders or, or spruce, if you try to do a 45 degree cast as such, more often than not, you're going to get caught up and you have to break off the fly or put a new fly on. But um, I'm going to just demonstrate what I use in fishing a bug. And it's like this. What I'll do is let the line trail down below me until it's almost straight, straight out. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to pick up the fly line and I'm going to throw it over my left shoulder as such and then bring it across. And by doing it, I'm getting the fly to move broadside, and I'm covering a lot more water. Um, the fly is drifting very naturally, and uh, more often than not, or, or so I would like to think, if there is a fish that's going to take, it would be somewhere in about there before the line starts to pick up speed. The cast Michael has described is very useful for all fly fishers who have to deal with tight cover or steep banks. As in all casting, the key is practice, both on and off the river. This cast is particularly useful for those who like to fly fish in areas with overhanging trees and bushy banks. Michael's friend and fishing companion, Mac Hawkins, has joined us on the Miramichi. When I asked him how he started into salmon fishing and why, his answer was typical of most anglers who are addicted to Atlantic salmon fishing. I've been fishing Atlantic salmon, I guess, for about 13 years. And what I like about it is just getting out in the river and casting your fly and just concentrating on hooking one of these beautiful Atlantic salmon. Some days they certainly can be challenging. But that's all the uh, that's all the fun of it. There's nothing like when you get that pull and you feel that surge in the rod. It's uh, it's a very uh, addictive feeling. And I think that's what uh, attracted me to it. Scientists have assured anglers that Atlantic salmon do not eat when they re-enter a freshwater river sea to spawn. Then why do they strike at flies such as the bomber? There's a myriad of reasons postulated by salmon anglers, but the most likely are aggression, curiosity, irritation, instinctive feeding habits, and playfulness. One of the presentations described in Michael's book, which I have personally found useful for salmon and other species, is known as waking the fly. With this presentation, you cast the fly at a 45 degree angle downstream and keep the fly and leader tight. Thus the fly arcs across the river on or near the surface, creating a small wake or V on the water's surface. This drives many fish crazy and they aggressively strike at the fly. This presentation method is good not just for Atlantic salmon, but other species such as steelhead, brown trout, and bass. Of note, is that you can use both a surface presentation for this method, such as using a large bomber, or a subsurface presentation by using a smaller pattern, such as a buck bug. Both are equally effective. The leader we are using today is a relatively simple construction. The key is to use strong tippet material to aid in quickly landing and releasing fish. There is quite a wide variety of patterns that have evolved in terms of bombers and bugs. Popular bomber and bug patterns include the green machine, blue smurf, glitter bug, and the many numerous variants of the brown bomber. 
Well, we've had a great couple of days fly fishing for Atlantic salmon using bombers and bugs. Unfortunately, conditions kind of changed and the fish have not been that aggressive and really passive. We've had quite a few of them come up and actually bump our bombers and bugs, but none have taken. That's fishing. Key is that if you really want to learn about bombers and bugs and how they apply to Atlantic salmon, as well as for other species such as trout and for bass, I strongly recommend you get Michael Brislane's book, Bugging the Atlantic Salmon. I know you'll enjoy it. From all of us here at the New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.